and here. So we are recording. Uh, we are live. Let me get the slideshow actually up and running. Let me hit the play button. Okay. All right, everybody. Lecture 23. So I think it's fair to say that we're sort of past the halfway point, like just passing it. Um, but we're rocking and rolling. We're, we're definitely where we need to be, um, especially with the weather. Um, we cut a couple topics out of bolts and welds, but um, we're, we're covering the, the, the fundamentals and we're getting close to an exam date coming up. So uh, this schedule, just so you're aware, has not changed at all since um, uh, it was originally put forth uh, after the first exam. Cause, so if you remember, you know, all the weather and whatnot. Once we started Bolted Connections, I put this schedule out and this is just a trimmed down version of the same thing. So today we're going to talk about welded connection analysis and then on Monday we're going to talk about welded connection design and you're going to have two homeworks on that. Uh, homework 4.1 is assigned today and homework 4.2 will be assigned Monday. On Wednesday, we're going to have our exam review. Uh, and so the exam is going to be on bolted and welded connections. Uh, and then we're going to have our spring holiday on Friday. So you're not going to have any homework due. You're not going to have any uh, uh, anything there. But when we come back on Monday, we're going to go ahead and have our exam. Um, that was always sort of going to be the schedule. Um, it was sort of the way of, of making the schedule work with that like that break that I had scheduled. If you remember, I had a break scheduled after the first exam and this was really the only way I could make it work. Well, that got a little difficult with all the ice storms and whatnot, um, but this way we get us, we get back on track. Um, in terms of uh, attendance and homework and all of that, so homework 3.4 is currently being graded. I was hoping to have that graded today, but uh, my TA is uh, a part of the capstone group that has a pretty major submission due today. Uh, so, uh, so that's, you know, understandable. But the solution is posted at 3.4. As for the exam one corrections, they have been graded. Um, so uh, the way that this worked, just so everybody remembers, um, you all got a chance to submit corrections for problem eight. And you could earn up to 10 points on problem eight, dependent upon how well you did uh, initially. So just, you know, if you look on Blackboard and it shows that you got like a, I don't know, like a four out of 10, but you got the problem completely correct. Remember that, uh, remember what it's doing. It's um, uh, it's adding, or it, it's taking into account the fact that, you know, if you got, let's say a three out of 10 or a four out of 10, that's because you only got four points off from the submission. Even if you got the assignment completely right, you got those four points back. Um, so what you should see on Blackboard right now are sort of three columns or three entries for exam one. You should see the original grade, your grade for the corrections, and then your final grade. So it, I, I tried to make it pretty clear because I know that there's a lot of grades because since uh, with the amount of homework that we have. So, but hopefully it's it's clear. If anybody has any questions, uh, let me know. Okay, we're going to get into welded connection analysis today, and then we'll talk about welded connection design on Monday. So let's. Uh, sort of take a step back. Let's make sure that we're all clear on where we left off last time. So first off, uh, you know, we spent a lot of time last time talking about the about just welding in general, the the welding procedures that we use, whether it's uh, uh, SMAW, GMAW, you know, uh, stick welding, MIG welding, you know, all that stuff. Um, we talked about the different types of welds that we deposit. So that would be like a tack weld, a, a plug and slot weld, a groove weld, but the, the king of all welds that we place in, in structural applications is the fillet weld. Uh, and that's what we're going to be um, spending our time looking at from a capacity you know, analysis and design standpoint. Um, and then we spent some time talking about the spec. And again, you know, with, um, with structural engineering, sometimes you find that you're hopping back and forth uh, around the spec and it just is what it is. Um, and so what we were able to do is sort of summarize welding spec into what you see here on this slide. And this is the stuff applicable for fillet welds or what I would call simple, you know, fillet welded connections. So there's um, weld metal capacity. So let's dig into that one for a second. So first off, we have the fee value, which is 0.75. We have the stress, the limiting stress, and the limiting stress for a weld is 0.6 times the electrode strength. And why 0.6? Because we're assuming our welds are loaded in shear. Um, and then as for the area of the weld, well, we take the length of the weld times the throat of the weld, the effective throat. And what is the effective throat of the weld? It's the distance from the root of the weld to the face of the weld. And if we assume that that weld geometry is a 45, 45, 90, um, that means that the effective throat is the size of the weld times 0.707 because it's just one over square root of two. It's just trig. 
Uh, so that's the weld metal capacity. So all you need is really three quantities. You need the electrode strength, the length of the weld, and the size of the weld, and you can compute that. It's just plug and chug. For the base metal, um, the, the capacity is governed by two limit states, shear yielding and shear fracture. Um, and so you need the FY and the FU for the material, but by now I think that's pretty easy. I think we kind of get that. Um, we need the gross area in shear and the net area in shear, but because we're dealing with a welded connection, we know that the gross area, or a fillet welded connection, I should say, the gross area and the net area are equal. So AGV equals A and V because we're not removing material from the plate in order to install something like a bolt. We're just lapping the plates and, and welding them. So, so no, uh, no difference in area. The fee values change, but that's just, you know, I don't want to say memory, but if you have that written down or, or able to find that in spec, that, that's, that's no real difficulty. Uh, and that's, that's basically it for capacity for the limit states. Um, we do have to assess uh, weld limits, so we're going to talk about that today. But I wanted to, first off, see if everybody is okay with this, see if anybody has any questions about what we talked about last time, and then we'll get into uh, just some other stuff on welds and talk about weld limitations. Sounds like everybody's good, so we'll go ahead and move on. Let's talk a little bit about some additional notes about proportioning connections. So I wanna talk about the weld orientation. Uh, so what we're gonna do in here, and this is conservative, and it, so just so you're, so you're aware, this is from a conservative standpoint and from a simplicity standpoint. Regardless of the weld orientation, we're gonna always assume that the welds will transfer, transfer the loads through the effective throat in shear. Okay, so we're not going to account for, for the weld orientation in, in this class. Uh, and what I mean by weld orientation is what I've got going here on these images below. So, for instance, um, you know, if we, wanted to, if we wanted to be hyper technical about it, we could assume that maybe this, this weld might see the, the stress a bit more in shear, whereas this one may be a little more tension. Okay. And so um, the way that we're identifying this is through um, these, these angles. So for instance, uh, and this is arbitrary, but it's, it's good for discussion. So we're saying that if theta equals zero, we're dealing with a, a longitudinal weld. If theta equals 90, we're dealing with a transverse weld. And if we're somewhere in between, we're dealing with an, an inclined weld. Now, if you're dealing with something like an eccentrically loaded connection, and we're not gonna deal with eccentrically loaded connections in this class, so don't worry about that. But if you're dealing with an eccentrically loaded connection, then the angle of orientation actually does matter in order to get the, the right capacity. So an eccentrically loaded connection would be something like if I had, you know, a plate here, and it could be bolts or welds, it doesn't matter. You know, I could have bolts, or you know weld it doesn't matter but an eccentrically loaded connection instead of loading it like this like like through oh, that is a horrible arrow sorry uh, instead of like loading it in tension this would be an eccentrically loaded or a simple connection uh, eccentrically loaded would be if i'm sort of bending it right so i've got this you know you know weld group right here if i'm welding this plate and then I'm loading it in bending. So the whole weld group kind of wants to rotate. Uh, and if you're doing, you know, any elastic analysis there, which is a, a way to do that, then you do need to understand those, uh, those, you know, weld orientations and whatnot. We're not going to worry about that in here, but I just kind of want to put that thought in your head for, for, for future work down the line if you go into to steel land. Um, but one of the things that I, I do want you to understand is that um, we're going to assume longitudinal welds, but I do want you to understand that the behavior does change depending upon the angle. I want to show you this graph here. So this is a graph. This actually comes right from the steel manual. Uh, it's, it's not in the spec. It's in an earlier part of the manual. If you go to the little silver tab that has the word welds on it and you go through that front matter, you can find it in here. It's actually, it's right there. So it's not, it's on page 8-11. So there's nothing here on this, uh, on this uh, slide that's not uh, that's not in the manual. Um, but what you can see here is a, uh, a graph and this shows the, uh, the, the behavior of a weld uh, that's loaded as a function of the angle change. And so what you're seeing is deformation on this side, so deformation and load 
on here. So this is the, you know, the Y axis is the load, the X axis is the deformation. Okay. And what you're seeing here is that as the um, angle increases, so as you go from a longitudinal weld to a transverse weld, what you're seeing is that the strength actually goes up. Like a transverse weld can hold up more load than a longitudinal weld, but it's also less ductile. Okay. We, I don't think we've really touched on this material um, uh, uh, aspect called ductility. So materials, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, if we're talking about the way that they fail, um, they, we can tend to broadly group those into two type of, types of failure modes. They can either fail in a brittle mode or fail in a ductile mode. And ductile failures are uh, uh, characterized by large inelastic deformation. So if you remember from materials, when you yank on a piece of steel, once you get past the yield stress, you get, uh, you, you uh, absorb permanent deformations. You know, it's permanently deformed. You get into that strain hardening phase. You, you, uh, I'm sure you all remember that. Um, steel is a very ductile material. It, it tends to withstand a lot of inelastic deformations before it fails. Concrete, for instance, on the other hand, is a, is a brittle material. Uh, it, it doesn't withstand a lot of deformation before it fails. Um, so, uh, you know, if we're looking at, at welds that are loaded transversely, we find that transverse welds have less ductility. They can withstand more load, but they're less ductile. So if they're going to fail, there's not a whole lot of warning that they're, that they're going to fail. So if you were analyzing a welded connection, not only is it conservative to assume that they're longitudinal because you know, if you assume longitudinal, you're assuming the worst case scenario from a load carrying uh, standpoint. Um, but you also get that, that added advantage of the fact that you know longitudinal welds are going to be more, um, more, more, uh, more ductile. Now, I want to be crystal clear. I have got no problem whatsoever with you putting a transverse weld on a piece of steel. I've got no problem with that. What I do have a problem with is this. Okay. So let's, let's draw some pictures here up top and I'll show you what, what Dr. Mike is okay with and what Dr. Mike is not okay with. Okay, so let's say, oh, sorry, I hit the little button here on my pen. Let's say I've got a piece of steel and I'm yanking on that steel with some load. And I'm just drawing, drawing the, uh, the image twice so that um, you can kind of see what I'm looking at. Okay, so Here's weld pattern number one. So I weld here. Oh, I weld. Oh, what's going on with my pen? All right, weld here, weld here, and I weld here. Okay. So in this instance, I would have two longitudinal welds. Right. These would be the longitudinal. This would be the transverse. There's nothing wrong with that. That's fine. Okay. Now. What if you had pattern number two and you just had transverse weld? This was the only way you welded the connection. If I find out that you did that in the field, I'm gonna ask you to stick your hand out. I'm gonna go like that. That's not good, okay? Because not only does that section have uh, uh, poor ductility, it also, and th this is a, another point that I hadn't really mentioned, but transverse welds don't tend to have the, or the best fatigue performance. So we talked about fatigue earlier. Transverse welds are, don't perform as well in fatigue. So structural steel designers, they pretty much never use just transverse welds. If you're laying out a connection, make sure to use not just tran uh, 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 transverse welds by themselves. Transverse welds are fine as long as they're accompanied by some longitudinal weld. Okay, any questions on that? Would it cost significantly more to weld members with patina due to surface prep? Uh, not really in the shop. You're going to do a lot of that stuff anyways, so that's not really an issue. I mean, l let me say this. The... Um, the real sort of kicker on on welds in terms of their economy is, you know, one, use them where they're appropriate. Uh, it's not like the surface prep really isn't the, the big deal because you're going to do a lot of that stuff anyways. Use them where appropriate. Don't just weld all over the place. Um, use proper weld details and also proper procedures. Uh, in structures land, I'd say if you really want to talk about economy, talk about money, talk about 
um, what can affect the project is like whether or not you weld in the shop or weld in the field. And I think that most structural engineers would almost universally recommend that welding be done in the shop unless necessary, unless you've got a weld in the field. Um, they would always prefer that you that you do the weld in the shop because there's more quality control. It's a, it's a controlled environment. Um, it's uh, you 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 have more control over um, the the you know the environment the the the, uh, the, the, the orientation of the piece. There, there's just so much. It's so much better uh, uh, quality. It's and it's and it also as, as Mr. Blizzard he's right. Uh, welding tends to also be cheaper in the shop. So. Uh, but the surface prep, I mean, they're going to, th that stuff's kind of going to be done already. So, like if you're doing, for instance, a groove weld, um, what about a connection? With, that's fine. The connection with just longitudinal welds, no problem at all. Um, the only reason to keep, the only thing to keep in mind is that if you, um, if you have, let's say, a, a member and you compute that it needs, like 50 inches of weld, you might want to put some transverse weld on there so that the weld isn't, you know, two feet long. So you might you might use that um, that transverse weld just to make the connection shorter. There's nothing wrong with that at all. Uh, but there's also nothing wrong with just longitudinal welds. I, I don't have a problem with that either. In fact, the example we're going to do has two longitudinal welds, and that's it. This is good stuff. Any other questions? All right, let's talk about weld limitations. Oh, hold on. Oh, here we go. Is there a difference between uh, in strength for a field weld over a shop weld? That's a good question. Um, I'd say largely no, assuming, I say largely no, assuming that the weld has been placed and meets all appropriate you know testing and and inspection and so on and so forth and that's and, and i mean mr blizzard put it right uh, that's where uh, welds in the field that's where their price comes from the fact that because it's more difficult to control that quality in the field they tend to be a bit more on the expensive side um now is there a difference in strength you know all things equal no uh, because you're still, you know, melting piece A to piece B, you know, with a, a consumable electrode, assuming that it's a, uh, a comparable quality, no. But if there were quality issues, then they'd make you re-weld it anyways, you know. So, so I, I don't think that would that would be a, a, a main issue. Now, I, I'm thinking that also answered your follow-up. Did it? Good deal. All right, let, let's talk about weld limits. Um, if you remember with bolted connections, so, so I want you to hopefully try and uh, think of some parallels between bolted connections and welded connections. So in bolted connections, when we were looking at strength, we either looked at the strength of the bolt or the strength of the plate. And with welds, we're looking at either the strength of the weld metal or the strength of the base metal. And there's very similar uh, 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 procedures there. In fact, there's very similar procedures on design too. Remember how with bolted connections, you determine the capacity of a bolt and divided to get the number of bolts. Well, in welds, we're going to determine the capacity of an inch, an inch of weld, and then divide to get the total number of inches. Um, there were also limits with layout. So with bolts, our two issues were we didn't want the bolts to get too close together uh, because we couldn't tighten them, and we don't want them to get too far apart because of water. Uh, getting in between the plates. Well, with welds, there are similar limits on the si minimum size of a weld and the maximum size of a weld. And they had, just like with bolts, how the layout requirements had nothing to do with strength, the weld limits kind of don't either. They're, they're a bit more related to strength, but they're for somewhat different reasons. So um, let's just sort of get into that. Uh, and let's start off with minimum weld sizes. So if I have plate A and plate B, and I have decided that I am going to weld them, I must produce a weld that at, that at least meets some minimum size. And so, first off, you can find that in the manual. It's on 16.1-119, and it's a function of the plate thickness, right? So I take the two plates, you know, the and it, when I say plates, again, I, I keep using that term 
uh, uh, pretty loosely. Plates could be just a plate of steel. It could be a flange and a W shape. It could be a web and a channel. Just any you know flat piece of steel that's being welded to another flat piece of steel. Um, I take the thinner part, whichever part is thinner, and I look at this table and I say, okay, if that the thinnest part is five eighths inch thick, then the weld needs to be at least a quarter inch. That's the, the weld size. And we tend to spec weld size out in sixteenths of an inch. So the weld is, has uh, the weld size is an eighth of an inch or three sixteenths or a quarter or five sixteenths, uh, et cetera. Now, the reason for these minimum weld sizes has nothing really to do with strength, but it has to do with um, what I like to call the heat sink effect, right? So I think you prob probably heard the term heat sink before. So what's the deal with the, uh, what's going on here? Um, imagine, I always like to go to extremes when, when I explain this. Um, imagine um, you had two plates that you were trying to weld together and those two plates were six inches thick. So these are, you know, ginormous plates, huge thick plates of steel. And I try and put a bead of weld on there that's like a sixteenth of an inch, right? That is a super tiny weld on these super massive thick plates of steel, okay? What's gonna happen is the plate is just gonna absorb all of that heat energy that you're putting into the connection and you're gonna get a weld that's that's had rapid cooling, it's gonna have low ductility, and it's not gonna perform the way that you want it to, okay? So whenever we're specking out welds, we have to at least deposit a, you know, some amount of weld in order to in order to actually you know, get a, a, a quality uh, a connection. So if we have a plate, for instance, that's between a quarter inch and a half inch thick, the weld has got to be at least 3 16 inch uh, uh, weld size in order, uh, or 3 16 inch long. I don't like to use the term long, maybe wide, maybe that'd be better. Uh, 3 16 inch wide in order to get a, a quality weld. Does that make sense? Anybody have any questions on that? Now that's for minimum weld size. What about maximum weld size? Well, if I'm joining two plates, you know, let's say here's the geometry, you know, you know, here's a plate. Here's a plate and I'm depositing fillet weld. You would think that the maximum size of the fillet weld is just, you know, the thickness of that plate because the weld can't go higher than that, right? And in some instances, yeah, that's the case. Um, that the 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 weld size is just limited to the plate thickness. But what we actually do in most instances is we back that off a little bit. Instead of saying that the weld size is limited to the plate thickness, what we do is we back it off a sixteenth of an inch. If you've ever done any welding, you know that what you're doing is you're melting two pieces of steel. Well, what would happen? if that weld got all the way up here, all the way up here, that you would start to melt this little corner. And so here's your plate, you know, here's your plate and you're depositing that weld. Once you start melting this corner, the you know, it, it starts to look a little weird, right? Because you start melting this out. Anybody who's done any welding knows that if the weld gets too big, that the, and you start lipping over that into the plate, that you start melting that corner of the plate and then the weld geometry doesn't look as pretty as if you just backed it off a bit. And so what we do in, um, in structural engineering applications is we say that if, uh, give me one sec, I'll, I'll answer that. But what we do in, in structural engineering applications is we say, if you have a plate of appreciable thickness, and I'll talk about that in a sec, but if you have a plate of appreciable thickness, we say that the weld size is limited to the thickness minus a sixteenth of an inch. And when I say appreciable thickness, I mean anything over a quarter of an inch. Any really thin plate, a thin plate being one that's like less than a quarter inch, we really don't care. And we say, you know what, it's so small, it doesn't really matter. Just limit the weld size to the plate thickness and that'll be fine. All right. Um, Mr. Acton, did you have a question? Uh, yes. No, I mainly I don't know how well my and aesthetics and all that but is it if the well partially melts it then combines with the melted metal does that mean it might get some strength from it 
as I said, I'm not familiar with this, so... I, could you ask that again? You said that if we're not careful, the corner might melt. The corner of the plate will begin to melt, correct? If the weld gets too big, you're going to start to melt this little bit right there. Like like this, um, my pen didn't do what I wanted to do. I'm talking about this little, little corner right there. Okay. But... In some is it in some cases a good thing, as I I'm not sure because I'm not fully familiar with this. So well, I I want the edge of well, a, a detailer is going to want the edge of the plate to remain well defined, so they're going to want that backed off. But to be clear, when you weld two plates together, you are essentially creating three molten products that are all being melted together plate A, plate B, and the weld consumable. So all that gets melted and solidified together to become one cohesive joint. Like that that's that's going to happen regardless of what I'm talking about here. Did that did that answer your question? Yeah. All right. Okay, any other questions? Okay. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention limits on weld length. Um, uh, so there are uh, limits on the minimum and maximum length of a weld. And so let me just sort of explain them. We're not going to use them in CE 414, and I'll, I'll tell you why. But let me explain them first. So first off, the lengths on a the limits on a minimum length weld. So the length of a minimum, or the, the minimum says that uh, if you have a weld, let's say the weld is a quarter inch, uh, you know, has a quarter inch weld size, uh, quarter inch wide, then the length of that weld is limited to four times the, the weld size. So a quarter inch uh, weld needs to be at least an inch long, for example. That we almost never have that problem in, in, uh, in structural engineering because you know, if we're if we've gotten to the point where we're depositing weld, we tend to that that we never really butt up against that uh, that um, that limit in real life, and we also never really tend to butt up on maximum weld limits. Now, there really isn't a maximum weld length limit. I'm talking when I'm talking about maximum limits here. I'm talking about length. Um, we never butt up against minimum limits because we end up depositing welds that are longer than the minimum anyways, but we also never really deposit welds that are uh, longer than the, than the maximum, I guess I should say. Now, I use the term maximum a bit loosely because the way that the spec works is there is no limit on a maximum weld length. However, if your weld gets really, really long, like a hundred times the weld size, that's pretty long, then there's a reduction factor that you have to apply to the capacity. And you can see that right here in the spec. Uh, it's not hard, it's just plug and chug. But um, we just, we never really approach that in real life. It's very rare that you have a weld that's that long. And so we just, um, we don't really use these weld limits very much. Uh, I mean, you have to meet the spec, but they just never really come up very much. Uh, I'm just not going to worry about them in this class because we're never going to have problems where this is uh, a deal. Like even if you design a welded connection to develop the full capacity of the member, you never really, uh, you never really get to this point. So it's just something to think about, uh, keep in the back of your head for you know future design. Uh, so just to summarize, this is really all you need to know for weld limits for welded connections is that. The minimum weld size you can find in table 2-4, and the maximum weld size is either the thickness or the thickness minus the 16th of an inch. Um, again, the reason for a minimum weld size is the heat sink effect, and the reason for the maximum weld size is because we want to maintain the geometry of the plate. We don't want to melt the tip of that, uh, uh, that, that corner of that plate. Um, any question before we get into an example? I think you're going to find this is pretty simple. Okay, so here's an example. We're gonna determine the design strength of this connection shown. Now, um, I've got two fillet welds. Now, let's talk a little bit about the symbol, uh, symbology right here, because this is the first time we've actually used weld symbols, I guess, uh, in, in the class. So what that means is that, uh, so there's three symbols that matter. There's the 516th, so that's the size of the weld. We have this 
triangle on the bottom. And so the triangle on the bottom means that it's a fillet weld. And because it's on the bottom, it means that the weld is on the side of the arrow. So what that means is like, if you look at the diagram, you can see those little, that little hatch where I indicated, okay, that's the weld. Um, if the arrow was on top, it would mean that the weld would be behind the plate, like on the other side of the image. So we can see the weld. If the arrow was up top, it would be behind the image. So that, and if you see it on both, like the top and bottom, then you just put the weld on both sides. And then the 15 means that each weld is 15 inches long. So the total length of weld in this picture is 30 inches. There's two 15 inch, 5 16 inch, or 5 16 wide fillet welds. There you go. Uh, the plate is 10 by 3 quarters of an inch and all the material is A572 grade 50. So, like I said, I think you're going to find this is pretty simple. Let me go ahead and stop my share. Okay, all right, so here's our connection. Now let's see what we can figure out. By the way, A572 grade 50 steel, can somebody tell me the properties necessary for doing some calculations with A572 grade 50? All right, so there we no, no, that's that's fine. Fy is fifty ksi. Fu is sixty five ksi, and that comes from table two dash five. Now we also know for the weld, we know that we have E seventy electrodes. So what is that? What do we know about that? So if you're wondering, I'm just going off of the problem descriptions. So there's A572 grade 50 steel. Here's E70 electrodes. Anybody remember what we know about E70 electrodes? There we go. Yes. I think Mr. Riggs is good for them. I'm going to start have to asking somebody else. So FEXX is 70 KSI. That's just our electrode strength. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. So we're going to take each one one at a time. So... So weld metal capacity. So we have a weld size of 5 sixteenths of an inch, which admittedly this is, I know that the, um, sometimes the manual calls that W. I use A. I, I, don't, I don't think it really matters, but just something to keep in mind. The length of the weld is 2 times 15 inches, which is 30 inches. And we know that FEXX is 70 KSI. So therefore... Phi Rn is phi, and then our limiting stress, and then our area. And that's it, you know? So 0 0.75, that's phi, 0 0.6, 70 KSI. 0 0.707, the length of the weld is 30 inches and the weld is 5 sixteenths wide. So what is that? Two hundred and eight point eight kips. Do I have a second on that? Okay, all right, so um, I'll go ahead and sort of circle this as the weld metal capacity. 
That's it. I mean, it's, it's really not that difficult. So that's the weld metal capacity. Now let's do the base metal. So since we assume everything's in shear, this is pretty simple because we know the length of the weld is 30 inches, okay? Now I'm gonna scroll up a bit. If you scroll up, look right here. See where the plate is three quarters of an inch thick? So if the plate is three quarters of an inch thick, like think about this like it is a, uh, a block shear problem. How would you determine the gross area in shear? Well, you would take the length of the connection multiplied by the thickness of the plate, right? It, it, you know, it's the same thing here. So this is 30 inches times 3 quarters and 30 times 3 quarters is 22 and a half square inches and then because we're dealing with a welded connection we don't have a bolted connection where we're removing material from we're not drilling holes we're not removing material from the plate in order to uh, uh, you know fabricate a connection the net area just equals the gross area pretty simple you know and then don't forget we know FY is, um, sorry, 50. And we know that FU is 65. So in order to do, so is everybody with me so far? I don't want to rush too far. Okay, so in order to determine a capacity we're gonna have two capacities. We're gonna have shear yielding and shear rupture. So maybe what I'll do is I'll say shear yield, sh shear yielding. Got tongue twisted there. And so for shear yielding, phi R N is phi times 0 0.6 F Y A G V. Okay, now does anybody remember what phi is for yielding? There we go. So one, this is 50. That's that. And so what does this come out to be? Six seventy five. Do I have a second on that? There we go. All right, so that's, you know, base. Base metal yielding. And so now what we do is we just do the same thing for base metal fracture. Really not that difficult. So, or I, I admittedly, I use the term fracture and rupture a little interchangeably. I'll use rupture since that's what's listed in the spec. So phi RN is phi times 0 0.6 FU A and V 0.75. Remember it's 1 for yielding, 0.75 for rupture. And then this is also 22.5. And so what's that? Six fifty-eight point we'll call it one. That's close enough. 
And that's it. So we have three capacities. We have a weld metal capacity of 208.8. .8. We have a base metal yielding and a base metal rupture that are each well into the 600 kips, so we know they don't govern. So therefore, if I want to know how much this connection holds up, That's it. Now we're not quite done with this problem because I want to, um, Mr. Enoch's making a good point. Um, it depends, it's not, so let me say a couple things about that. You are more often than not correct, but uh, for a, this is for a fillet weld, mind you, so so don't, don't uh, apply this globally, but it does depend on the base metal utilized and the um, the size of the weld and the electrode. So for example, what if instead of uh, A572 grade 50, this was A36 steel? And what if instead of E70 electrodes, it was E90 electrodes, you know, or E80 or something? That might change it a bit, you know? Does that make sense? For this problem, it was pretty lopsided, you know. Any questions? All right, let's check. Um, give me one sec. I want to check something. Let me see if I can do this really easily. Oh, sorry. Hold on. Sorry. Sorry about that. I'm trying to copy a picture because I'm a little lazy here. All right. Hold on. Thank you. Where did my mouse go? There we go. Okay. So here's our, so we're also going to check our weld size. So So remember we had a weld size that was 5 sixteenths and then we have a thickness that's uh, three quarters, right? The plate in this instance was three quarters of an inch. Okay. And so for a plate that's three quarters of an inch, we say over half an inch to three quarters of an inch, the minimum weld size is a quarter of an inch. So a minimum, sorry, not three, a minimum is a quarter of an inch. As for a maximum, a maximum is either the thickness or the thickness minus a sixteenth of an inch. Sorry, sixteenth. And this is whether or not the thickness is less than a quarter of an inch or the thickness is greater than or equal to a quarter of an inch. So we're clearly, you know, on the second row, and so that's gonna be, you know, three quarters minus a sixteenth. And so three quarters is 12 sixteenths. 12 sixteenths minus one is 11 sixteenths. So we have A min is a quarter and A max is 11 sixteenths. And then our weld size is five sixteenths. So You know, that's not too bad. Told you this was, uh, told you this, this was pretty simple, right? <laughs>
Everybody's quiet though. Yeah, this is this, okay. There we go. Not even a, that's I welds are easy. I, I've been saying that for a while that welds. <laughs> Do I strike you as one of those professors that, you know, there's that meme where it's, uh, you know, homework, two plus two equals four, you know, the exam, calculate the mass of the sun. Like, do I strike you as one of those guys? Yes, sir. Um, I'm just out of curiosity here, but will we have to eventually do a problem where we have to remove and then redo a well? Because you said that earlier that a well mixes with the different plates, correct? So we may have to Wait, what? Remove. What? Say that, ask that again. One moment. In basic terms, will we eventually have to do a problem where we'll have to redesign a weld or because it doesn't fit No. The but but we're not in design land. That you'll be more equipped to uh, like address that on Monday because Monday we're going to do welded connection design. Now let me let me qualify uh, what we're doing here. We are doing what are called simple connections, and by simple connections we're just taking a piece of steel and yanking on it. You know, if you have beams that are being bent, if you've got splices and all that, I mean connections can get very difficult. I, I don't want you to um, to think that you know you, you you took you know this and you're learning everything there is to learn about connections I could teach an entire college course on just connections easily because um, we could have you know uh, uh, um, we could do you know, a library of, of common connections and check all of the associated limit states going with that column base plates you know eccentrically loaded connection splices we could make a whole semester just on on, on connections so we don't have time so in, in that realm we're just doing simple connections and there's a reason they're called simple connections because they're simple <laughs> um no but but the loading is 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 basic there's no eccentricity there's no bending it's just you know axial load on a member um so in that realm like there's not a lot to it um but to go specifically to your question the and design it's gonna make a lot more sense on monday how we go about designing a welded connection I, and i there isn't even really any iteration with what we do. I saw what Mr. Randolph said, by the way. I'll remember that. I, actually, I might not, if I'm being honest. I'm just telling jokes. Hey, it's a, it's an easy topic. In, in all honesty, my solution for this homework coming up, if it wasn't just for like the size of the images and whatnot, this would all fit on one page. Hey, this is a short assignment. If you understood what we did today, it's like the same thing. You know, it's not hard. Any questions? If not, I'm going to end this a little bit early today. A little bit. It's only two minutes, but. All right. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording then. Uh, but if anybody has any questions, y'all know where to reach me. But I hope everybody has a good weekend for you capstone folks. Best of luck getting everything rounded out between now and five o'clock. And I will see you here in a bit or here, here on Monday. Man, as soon as I end class, I'm getting a call. All right. I will see you all later. <laughs>